Okay, scholars, colonial revolutionary America scholars. Um, I want to talk about this, this aesthetics that changes into what we call the early national period, going out of the colonial into the revolutionary and then into a full-fledged sort of early national period. And people are thinking, thinking very consciously about what should be the look of America? What should be our character? How should our character be expressed in clothing and houses and paintings and everything? And so just going to touch on this little romp through some things. So this is what we're dealing with here is these notions of Republican simplicity. The idea of simplicity, somehow, you know, that there's a French and a Spanish Baroque, which is so wild with all of its twists and curls and stuff. This is this is heading toward the Baroque here. This is this classical, you know, you know, with the wigs and everything, you know, that this is the Jefferson was a quite the dandy, you know, in this in this uh way. And uh he is gonna have to start thinking and he will change. He will be thinking about about what should be the American sort of way to dress and look and what do we need in America aesthetically. Uh, this is, of course, Abigail and John Adams. And uh, this is, uh, you know, here they are in their Middle Ages and stuff, which is early. I mean, I think these might be wedding portraits or something, but this, so they might, might be just be in their 20s or so. But this would be like a, a folk colonial, you know, uh, this is this is when the colonies are definitely provincial, you know, and so you don't you get a frontier painting style that is uh, definitely not well developed. Okay, this is a painting done uh, when when um, Jefferson is in France and uh, he has a French person does it. You can see he's he's dressed in what we what is generically we're going to talk about as a neo neo classical. Okay, and, and this is going to be the movement we're talking about from colonial to a sort of like there's these Baroque models of the 16th, 17th century into uh, a type of, of neoclassical that's going to come. And, and early America is going to reflect this neoclassical. Now, I talked about this before. This is the Georgian architecture. There's a whole bunch of King Georges, George one, two and three, you know, and we rebel against three and. And the Georgian architecture is a very austere architecture when it gets to America. It, in England, it has much more graciousness and stuff like that, but it's heavily oriented toward geometry. It's a, it's, it reflects for us the enlightenment love of math and geometry and, and the ideas. And we're going to carry that in, too. This is, these things don't disappear and move from A to B. They the uh, Enlightenment Georgian architecture is going to move into the neoclassical that we're going to look at here. And, and so keep this in mind, the, the beautiful symmetries of the window panes and, the, and, and how everything works. You, you have a manual, you have actually these manuals that you buy and you just hand it to your contractor and say, here, build this. This is the With House um, in uh, Williamsburg. It's still there. Beautiful house. Uh, this is the Harrison, um, um, you know, Benjamin Harrison, the Harrison family, two presidents of the United States. This is their estate on the end of, on the James River. And you get that, cla uh, that Georgian architecture there. This was built around 1730s, I think, 1740s, and a nice classical pediment. You see those, those little, those classical, and those are, Doric looking ish, you know, they're squared off, but they're these classical pediments here, the small door, and then or these are classical columns within this is called the pediment, is that triangle there. Now, if you want to get super fancy, this is done about 19, or excuse me, 1730s. This is Westover on the, uh, the James River also. And uh, you could get this see this sort of fanciness there and stuff like that. But America is not going to head that way. See, that's sort of like foo-foo. And then you see those columns there? Those are ionic columns. They, I'm pretty sure they have the little scrolls on them and stuff. And so when you have those little scrolls on the edge of your column, that's ionic. And then, so 
this is this is sort of the culture of the 1700s going into the revolution is a commitment to a type of rationalist georgian very pleasant with the brick you know and and um um certainly leaning toward the austere the the symmetrical um now George is part of this, and uh, George rides the transition, and he's sort of fun because he shows in his concern for his land and his place, he shows that character that's on the lookout for what should America look like, what should I look like, what I want to change the way I look, and yet at the same time, this American provincialism that George has, he's, he isn't the sophisticated guy that George, uh, that the uh, Je Thomas Jefferson is. And so, so we get, here's the, this is this map here, you know, this is this map, here's the Potomac River, and here's George's house right there. And this is what it looks like, it's called the Palladian Plan, it's, the, it's that standard throughout the 18th century where you have these outbuildings, comes from Italy, Palladian Plan, and you know, he then, the original house was small, and then he expanded up and out, you know, and especially after he's uh, uh, been the general in the French and Indian War, and then especially after the American Revolution, he expands this house out. And he has lots and lots of visitors until he dies, and so visitors will come and stay at this house. And so it's a great house, and he knows it's a showpiece. He knows he's building a showpiece. However, we talked about this before, he's got your nice classical pediment, he's got your classical pediment, he's got your nice classical door frame here, but dang it, is this embarrassing or what? People would comment on this, they'd come from Europe and they'd be traveling around, they'd visiting the new America, and they're looking at George's house going, oh, this is an embarrassment, this is an embarrassment, this is, this is basically, you know, uh, a folkish attempt to try and be classical but just a complete failure <laughs> um, and so if you're a sophisticated person you're thinking that oh my goodness this is really bad but you see this is what makes George this so so special is George is going to be willing to hide behind trees to fight the war he's, he's willing to break the rules the rules that are set by the high sophisticated from the top down he's willing to break and his house shows this he has the stone here, but this house is made of wood. He, the plaster just makes it look like stone. And this is the back of it. He puts this big, you know, it's a beautiful, you know, gracious house coming down to the Potomac River down here. And he adds some really nice touches. This is out of a book. This is a Palladian window that is on the side of the house over here. And yeah, beautiful house, beautiful house. But, but. Right there, man. That's 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 the sign of George's mind. He he knows what he's doing, and it, this is the. I take this to be the same principle that got him in trouble, or got John Adams in trouble with him, which was John Adams wanted to address the president as His Excellency or Your Highness or some sort of title, and he said, "No, American presidents are going to be called Mister President." And, uh, and maybe miss Mrs. President someday, but miss Mr. President. And so this is the, this is the equivalent of the Mr. President, man. This is where uh, we are not going to play the game of the aristocracy in England. We're not going to especially, because this would require, to move that door and make this symmetrical would require a lot of money, extra work. There's a load-bearing wall in here. There's a staircase. You know, to get this right would have been a major expense. And so, therefore, you know, hey, we're playing the game, but we're not playing the game completely. That's, that's the sort of interesting thing there. John Adams, also, this is John and Abigail later in life, of course. Uh, John was born in this house, and then he lived in this house later with Abigail. Uh, this is during the Revolution. They live in this house, and notice it has the nice pediment. So what they've done is they've done the sort of old colonial, you know, 17th century English house, created this sort of salt box, which is a very sort of rationalist, sort of enlightenment. It has the symmetries and stuff, and it has the door frame, but it's still very sort of folkish, frontierish. This is in Quincy, Massachusetts. 
And then outside of Quincy, when he came back after the revolution, he bought this house here. This is what it looks like today. And it's a Georgian house. You can see the nice you know, pediments here. It's classical in its way, and it's very symmetrical in its way. Uh, but at the same time, it's a, uh, um, it like George Washington's house, shows a type of frontier, uh, provincial, and, um, uh, you know, we're just not trying to play the aristocracy game here. And that's John Adams, all right? Now, we get to Thomas Jefferson, though, and Thomas Jefferson is much more conscious of the sort of aesthetics and playing the aristocracy game and being an aristocrat, and he's a very hard guy to figure out. Um, uh, but he noticed now, after the revolution, we this is a peel painting, you know, he's a much more austere dressing, you know, with the, not with the bright colored coat, you know, and he's his little foo-foo has gone down a lot and he's no longer wearing the wig and stuff like that. So he's, he's going to sort of be, in his mind, representing Republican simplicity. This guy here is Charles Bullfinch, and as a young man out of Boston, um, his family had been loyalist, and, uh, but after Boston, he, um, he comes and he wants to tour Europe. And uh, this is a sort of normal educational thing, Interest in architecture is widespread. Everyone is supposed to be interested in architecture. And Thomas Jefferson advises him to keep an eye on architecture. He's engineering, canals, things like that. And so Charles Bullfinch, as a young sort of gentleman, becomes an architect. And he will eventually become uh, really a professional architect after he loses some money and has to actually make his money as an architect. But this is the first... Harrison Gray Otis House in, uh, this is on the edge of Beacon Hill. And we call this Federalist style. And it's a type of uh, uh, austere New England uh, neoclassicism. But it's Georgian in certain ways. You can see that there's that Palladian window. Here's the, this is called a fan here. You have the nice door. It's boxy, it's symmetrical. And yet inside these, this lower, look at how big those, this is a very gracious house. Very, inside it's just beautiful. Now, this is the second Harrison Greatest Otis house. And notice you have Corinthian columns on the outside. The little balustrade on the top, you know, and we're getting pretty nice here. And then these very gracious rooms inside that are not necessarily symmetrical inside anymore. Notice the, the barrel here. That Also, you're going to get that barrel look. And I'll show you. There's that barrel look over there. You see it the, where you, you create a, a cylinder. And then this is the third Harrison Gray Otis house. Very beautiful inside. And you enter here and come up to the, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, showpiece area here. And this is Beacon Hill also. All three of these houses are on Beacon Hill. And Harrison Gray Otis was the leader of this sort of New England Federalist bunch that are making their money, especially out of Salem, Massachusetts. And we'll talk more about that. And they create what's called the Essex Junto and such. But War of 1812, we'll talk about them. But what you have is a very conscious attempt by a very great architect in early America, Charles Bullfinch, to create something that's deeply, deeply representative of this new nation and who these people want to show themselves to be. They want to show themselves to be a very austere to the street, gracious inside, and distinctively uh, American, really. Now, uh, every state now, because we're a state, needs a new state house, okay? So Bullfinch designs what becomes the greatest of all the state houses. This is the Massachusetts State Capitol building. And he cut and paste a bunch of neoclassical stuff from England together to do it, but it's, it's really beautiful. And if you notice, what you have is this, this dome. This becomes the iconic thing, is you have like one part of your legislature, like the assembly here and the Senate here, and they meet to compromise 
under the dome, a sort of symbol of Republican government here. And this is what it looks like now. And notice you have the, the beautiful brick. Uh, you have these very gracious, you know, sort of Palladian windows here. Uh, and then it gets more austere as you go down, giving a solid foundation. But look at that. This is a beautiful, beautiful building. And it's there on the commons there on top of Beacon Hill. Now, Thomas Jefferson. See that? This is, this is neoclassical. It's got all these classical, that pediment, that little triangle, the dome is, is something that is Roman. The arches are Roman. This is neoclassical, neo-Roman architecture. Uh, and then Jefferson is going to take it and create a sort of, he's going to put it on steroids in a type of high rationalism, a high idealism. You got your fancy balustrades here. You got your pediments there. This is called a frieze here. Uh, there's your dome, but it's added to these little stair steps. You know, this is an amazing house. I think it's one of the most beautiful, maybe the most beautiful house in America. I, you know, I go there. I'm not a huge fan of Jefferson. He always confuses me, but Boy, when I walk around this house, it's just, just, just beautiful. It's actually bigger than it looks. Has the arms going out. See, there's the arms, the Palladian arms heading out. And then there's a basement underneath this. There's this grand, gracious floor here. And then there's a whole nother floor that, that goes. So what looks like almost a one-story building is actually, you know, it's three stories. It's one, two, three stories. And then it has the dome there with a the, with the nice room inside of that. So it's a very interesting building and octagons here, here, and here. He loved this, that, that's that, you know, enlightenment geometry is coming through, but there's also a new romanticism about octagons being better than squares. You know, how the Federalist style loves the, the cylinder, you know, bullfinch, especially up north, loved the cylinder, the bull, that, that, that uh, barrel. And then, and then uh, there's also this love of Jefferson for octagons, okay? So this house, you know, sits here and it has its arms going out like that. And uh, this is the estate at Monticello on top of a hill. It's not a very smart house. You don't build things like on top of the hill. It's not very economically smart. It's built, for a, it's built for as a showpiece. And it's built to have a view of the rest of the world, um, you know. So it's, it's a strange house. But it's Jefferson strange. That's who Jefferson is. This is a strange house, too. This is Jefferson built this. Uh, it's also an octagon. You see, it's got your pediment. It's your classical. And it's built to represent an Indian mound. And uh, this, is, this is Jefferson. You know, it's very rationalist, very neoclassical, very gracious, very beautiful inside. And, uh, and uh, just... Pleasant in every bit and way. Wouldn't that be a wonderful little, you know, house to have? So, Jefferson is very interested in creating a new aesthetic, creating a new educational structures and stuff. This is where, you know, he puts on his tombstone. He's founded the University of Virginia. University of Virginia also has as its centerpiece a, a uh, building which is straight out of copy of Rome. And then you see you have that Palladian plan going this way. Uh, he copies the, the uh, copies pretty much. The, the, um, this is called the Pantheon in uh, temple architecture in Rome. But then he puts the little stair steps on, but it has the same principle, which is inside there's a sphere which actually gives you the floor here, gives you the walls there. Notice it's a barrel. The whole thing is a barrel. So it's a cylinder barrel with the outbuildings going this way. And here we have, what kind of architecture is this? This, is, this has the look of ascanthus leaves. That's Corinthian. Corinthian is with the little leaves that come out. Our forum on our, in Colt Hall has Corinthian inside of it. You know. So this is, this is Jefferson. Jefferson very consciously sort of looking to a new architecture to represent the new values of the American nation. Same thing's going on. Jefferson's involved. A whole bunch of people are involved in creating what is going to be Washington, D.C. Now, uh, they've decided that they're going to build it on the Potomac River here. And 
this is going to be a new Rome. One of the interesting things here is that you have this Alexandria here. So this is like the, the uh, this is the Rome across the Mediterranean from the from Alexandria. So this is North Africa, and this is this is Italy over here. So it's fun. Now what happens is is that you have this design plan, which gives you know all sorts of places to put statues and stuff to teach about American history and American heroes, and then you have this mall. And you have this, this is the president's house, and this is the Capitol building. So you have a representation of the executive branch and the, the um, uh, legislative branch. And the Capitol building, as I'll show you, has the two branches in the architecture and, and with a dome in the middle. Now, what's interesting here is this is basically uh, designed to be like... Uh, or let me let me just put it here. Yeah, well, I'll put it here. Williamsburg, when Williamsburg, Virginia was built, it was built with a very nice design like this. And here's the Capitol. Here's the governor's house. Here's the church, Bruton Parish Church. And then this is where, where William and Mary is, the education. Okay, so there was basically an expansion of this model here. So, so what you have is the Capitol building here, President's house there, the mall here. Now, as this gets filled in and developed over the next couple hundred years, the Lincoln Memorial is gonna be built there. The Washington Monument is gonna be built right there, okay, at the centerpiece. And then over here, the under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you're gonna get the Jefferson Memorial built here. So you get this, this plan here that expresses, here again, the great values of what you're supposed to get out of, out of America. Now, you know, many of us would debate about the choice of different pic, uh, statues and who, who gets where and stuff, but the basic constitutional structure is the president executive, and then you have the, the uh, colonial, the legislative branch, which is the uh, Senate and the House of Representatives. Now, notice here we don't have the uh, Supreme Court. Supreme Court building is here now behind the uh, Capitol and is representative really of how the Supreme Court grew as a sort of later development of the Constitution. So that's sort of interestingly reflective too. Now, the President's House is uh, grand, but it is not Grand. It is. It is also Republican simplicity, Roman neoclassical simplicity. There's your pediment. You know your symmetries and very gracious. You have those. You know those big windows like we talked about with Federalist graciousness inside, but a sort of austere outside with the Palladian plan here. Jefferson adds the little uh, uh, semicircle thing there and also the pediment uh the expansion of the porch on the other side i'm pretty sure he does now uh bullfinch comes in and takes over the um the building of the uh, of the united states capitol the big dome that we have today didn't come until you after the civil war that was continued to be built during the civil war it was a, lincoln wanted that architectural dome to be a symbol of the union of holding things together so that dome continued to be built during the, uh, during the Civil War. But this is what Bullfinch did. And so you have the over here, very gracious neoclassical architecture, not grand by any sort of European standards, but certainly very grand by American standards. And then you have a, you know, uh, I'm not sure which side. I think this is the House over here, and then this is the Senate. But they meet to compromise in the middle under the dome. So that's that's you know there's a real conscious architecture here and then eventually we'll see under under democracy uh, under Jackson there'll be a rise of the Greek architecture but this is Roman we're going to be a new a neoclassical a neo Roman empire and that's that's the values that are heavily in our our republican structure now just Quickly, this is Charles Wilson Peel, of which uh, we've already learned about through Natalie's paper. This is Benjamin Rush, who, you know, we also, this is Joseph Brandt here. These are paintings by Charles Wilson Peel, and he did this museum. Here again, very conscious of 
he is going to sort of build up the natural science, the aesthetics, the, you know, we're, we're, we're smart people with glasses on our heads. Here's his painting of, of George Washington, which is, I think, a great one. I really like that. His is Alexander Hamilton. And then Ben's looking, looking wise there. Alexander's looking a little bit flourished. woo -hoo! you know, and, and he has that inside of him, you know, look at the two here, that's, I think we're talking Alexander Hamilton and George, and I think you get the, the difference between the two there, also you get wonderful paintings of, this is Charles Wilson Peel's mom, yeah, and then this is, this is uh, another intelligent, you know, look at the, look at the eyes on these women, you know, they're very, now, uh, one of the things is that we've, we've presented a type of progress or something, but on the other hand, is we don't want to overplay this, the, probably the greatest painter in early American history um, is a colonial character of, uh, just out, coming out of Boston. Uh, his name is, is John Singleton Copley. And as a young man, he, he just trained himself, and eventually during the war, during the Revolutionary War, he goes to England. But that's his... Thomas Hancock, and you can see, wow, these, that's Sam Adams pointing at the Massachusetts Charter there, you know, and, and look at, this is, this is, this, these, are the, uh, look at, look at these women here. Now these, there's models for this, you know, the English, she's using English models, but look at these women. These are, you look at the models and they're much more sort of, uh, the European models are like very aristocratic, foo-foo, you know, lots of fluff and stuff, neoclassical. This is, these are just beautifully austere. And then, of course, he, he's the one who went searching for a mammoth, you know. So uh, with that, uh, just wanted to touch on that, romp through a little bit of aesthetics. and um, But we're thinking about people being conscious as they move into the new nation as to what are we, who are we, what are we going to do, what should we look like.